President of Beaches Watch. Uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with Beaches Watch, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan civic organization, and we host monthly meetings like this one with speakers talking about topics that are that our beaches communities are interested in. And uh, we also have an agenda. I hope you picked up one tonight. Um, on the back of the agenda, we've got contact information for all the three beach city elected officials, as well as the school board, um, ja city of Jacksonville, and our state representative. Um, so if you ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, you know how to, con how to contact them. We don't have the city manager's contact information on here. Right. Mm -hmm. have that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Real quick before we get started with the meeting, uh, if you if you can look at your agendas, there's a few things on there I want to mention to you. The closure of the Beaches Branch Library, the proposed closure of the Beaches Branch Library, we hope everybody is aware of that, and we hope everybody's written a letter uh, or email or phone call to Mayor Brown and to all the Jacksonville City Council people. Um, and there's some information on here on how to contact the mayor and the city council. Uh, also, be, yes, ma'am. Sybil's out there with the petition, also. Oh, okay. Um, Sybil Onsbacher, she is involved with the Save Jacks Libraries group, and they've got a petition. They're trying to get a independent taxing district uh, approved to help fund our libraries, so we don't <coughs> keep ending up in this position. Uh, so she's got the peti petition out at the table out front. So at the end of the meeting. If you haven't signed it, please consider doing that. Um, then also, we have been recording our meetings, and so if you have not been able to attend a meeting, we'd like to go back and, and look at some of the meetings that we've had. I put the link on here because we have a YouTube channel, a Beaches Watch YouTube channel. And uh, thanks to Jet, who's been recording all of our meetings, you can go and catch up on something that you might have missed. And then also, we hope if you live in Atlantic Beach, you'll mark your calendars because Wednesday, August 14th, Beaches Watch is hosting a candidate forum for the Atlantic Beach elections. Atlantic Beach elections are August 27th. So we, uh, and we're also going to be putting information on our website about the candidates um, like we've done in the past. So we hope you'll use that as a handy dandy resource for helping you make your decision before you vote. And uh, as always, we encourage you to join Beaches Watch. If you haven't joined Beaches Watch, um, $10 for individual, $15 for family, and it just helps us continue to do the things that we're doing. Uh, membership is Atlantic Beach, Neptune Beach, and Jack's Beach residents, and we would love to have you as a part of the organization. Uh, our next meeting is going to be Wednesday, August 7th, and we're going to have Chief um, Pat Dooley, and he's going to do our yearly update that Chief Thomason used to do about the issues the, that the police department in Jack's Beach have been dealing with. Um, and and it's, uh, it, it's kind of timely because we've had July 4th and so it would be a great opportunity for him to give us an update on how things went with July 4th as well as anything else that may be going on. So we hope you guys, it'll be 7 o'clock at the library in the community room. So we hope everybody will plan to attend. So. I would like to go ahead and get the meeting started because we have a lot of information tonight. We're very pleased to have all three Beach City Managers here tonight. This is a big honor. I don't know how often this actually happens, but uh, we have Jimmy Jarbo, who's the, the City Manager for Neptune Beach. We have Jim Hansen, who's the City Manager for Atlantic Beach, and we have George Forbes, who's the City Manager for Jacksonville Beach, and each of them are going to be talking about be their beaches budgets tonight and what we're going to do is each one's going to have about 15 minutes to do their presentation and once all three of them are done then we'll open the floor for questions that way we can make sure that they get their presentations done and then and then we can have questions after that so we're going to start tonight with Neptune Beach and we want to thank um, Jim Jarbo and the city of Neptune Beach for hosting the meeting tonight we really appreciate it. You guys are always very accommodating. And uh, so, please uh, keep an eye on it. 
Go right ahead. Yeah. Well, I thank you all for allowing us to come down here and explain a little bit about the budget. Many, many, many years ago, I was in graduate school in the public administration program learning how to do budgets. And I learned all the acronyms, the PPBS, the you know, zero-based budgeting, all sorts of different ways that you budget. And I thought I knew everything about budgeting. And then I became a city manager. And I learned over the years, especially now with the revenue shortfalls that you have to deal with, is that not only do you have to know a lot about budgeting and finance, but you also have to be somewhat of an artist and also a psychic to understand what's going to happen in this process. To give you an example, and I know uh, Lang, Neptune, I mean uh, Jacksonville Beach, George went through this maybe two or three years ago, and last year we went through it. Uh, we put our budget to bed, we had all the numbers from all the different agencies, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, they said, oh, we were wrong. We've got new numbers for you, and your budget's already put to bed. Well, you know, it's extremely difficult to raise unless they allow you to, to raise it. Luckily, in our case, they were going to allow us to raise it. Our council elected not to do that, so we were able to figure out how to put the budget together. Uh, in the last probably six years, uh, we have tried to figure out how to do our budgets on our existing revenue. And, of course, the revenue has taken a nosedive, especially because of housing prices. And uh, at war, our uh, home taxes account for about... 50% of our revenue stream. But to give you an idea, uh, everything's based on millage. A mill here in uh, Neptune Beach is worth about $650,000. This up at the top is Neptune Beach, this is Atlantic Beach, and this is Jack's Beach. As you can see, the three sister cities of the beaches have the lowest tax rate of any place around in Northeast Florida. And I think that's commendable for both the managers and the councils being able to put a lot of work and a lot of services with less money than some of our sister cities. And I'll kind of pass this around so that y'all can look at it and get some idea if you want to. It's, I know it's kind of hard to see it back there. Now, being a small city, it's extremely difficult for us to find the revenue because we're sandwiched in between Atlantic Beach and Jack's Beach, so we have no ability to do outside revenue like uh, outside sewer service to other areas to charge for that or electric authority or those kind of things. So we're kind of stuck with what, what we get. There is no creative way. And so in the last uh, six years, what we have done, as you can see here, is we've actually, through attrition, lowered the number of staff. We started out with 80 and now we're down to 66 staff members. And this helped tremendously and keeping the ad valorem tax rate at, at a reasonable level. Now, one of the things that uh, we had to deal with is uh, figuring out how, because reducing staff didn't do everything we needed to do. So we had to figure out what we were going to do. We cut out 90% of the travel. We cut out the association memberships. Now the travel was used to educate the staff because a better educated staff performs and does a better job. In our case, we didn't have the money, so we did that. We gave up uh, our membership and associations. For example, uh, I used to be a member of the International City Managers Association and went to their training and stuff, and I no longer do that because we just don't have the revenue to do that. Uh, and uh, we went through the budget, and we had a big... Uh, move on to do a lot of stuff in-house that was our guys were trained to do it. Give you a good example, we do all our cement work in-house, like curbs and gutters and that kind of thing. And uh, one of the other things we did, uh, we wanted to get out from under the Jack Beach Electric Authority in City Hall here, so we got a solar grant, put a solar grant upstairs, and our guys actually did the installation. And that was our contribution to the grant, and also saved us about $90,000 to be able to do that. When we start the budget, we start thinking about the budget usually in late March or early April. Uh, we work, the finance director and I work, we look at our goals, we talk to council members about what they would like to see. We have an informal process. 
then in April we start working a little bit with the uh, department heads and they're telling us all their sob stories and how much they want and what they need to do and that kind of thing. So, and so by the end of May we start formulating the budget and we usually come out with our preliminary budget. The problem with the budget and doing it sooner than that is that you never know, like I mentioned before, what the revenue is actually going to be that you're going to have to deal with because the uh, county <coughs> property appraiser revenue changes right up until the end of the budget and also the state revenue is also flexible and it changes quite a lot. So you, you never know and it may be mid-year and if you have a downturn after you've already put your budget together then you're going to have to probably go to reserves or start cutting staff. Anyway, um, in uh, late July, we're getting close to that point, early August, uh, the council is going over what we had and going through that process. They may have workshops into August and then uh, in September you have two public hearings on the budget. One to set the, the village and the other to actually to implement the budget. And then you have to coordinate around the school board in Jacksonville to find the right time. People have a chance to come up and say yay or nay on the budget or I think you need to be doing this or you shouldn't be doing this in that process. Um, our budget right now for what general fund and that's where most of the taxes that you pay for for your house and the stuff we get from the state uh, it's about four I guess we get about four and a half million in revenue and we spend about that in revenue not quite that much and uh, this will give you a little idea of what happened to us over the last uh, six or seven years this was our revenue on our base year 2006 was just under four million six hundred and fifty thousand and now the revenue that we're getting in right now is two thousand uh, excuse me is basically a little under uh, uh, probably about forty four thousand uh, four million four hundred thousand and so as you can see the revenue now the reason they increase in this year and this year and this year is because we received grants and so one of the grants we received was uh, help to be able to retrofit our sewer plant and that's one of the things we have to deal with as managers in the budget are unfunded mandates from federal and state agencies to be able to put together one of those was the nitrogen issue you may have read about keeping nitrogen out of the St. John's and um, it's not a simple process and everybody wants to do it but they don't realize they have to pay for it and it costs. In Neptune Beach we were able to get a grant for half of the process and the other ha half uh, we used a new type of <coughs> system, I like to call it the bug system because it creates microbes that eat uh, a lot of the particles and it help us clean up the system. We were able to do that for about two million and got about a million dollars in grants. Originally, the, we re-engineered from what the uh, original engineers told us. They had mentioned it was going to cost four to six million dollars to do, and we would probably have to triple our water and sewer rates. And we knew that citizens couldn't afford that, so we did that. That came outside the budget year, and we had to figure it in the next budget year. Once we go through the the process of the budget, uh, it, the budget is a living document. It changes constantly. Uh, after you set the budget, it has to change for whatever events may come up, for example, the unfunded mandates again. So we go through that process. Give you another idea. This is the general fund revenues by category. And you can see the majority, 50% of it, is ad valorem tax. And then sales and use tax is 14%. And franchise and utilities is the other big one at 14%. So this kind of is a breakdown. And if y'all would like to look at that. Now the general fund by function, this is where we actually spend our money. And it gives you some idea. 61% of our funding is public safety. And... Uh, we only have uh, 17 police officers, and we could have used probably 200 4th of July. 
So, and then uh, if you look at public works, it's 10% of it. In general government, which uh, covers a wide range of things, management, planning, building, and all sorts of other associated things, and street cleanup and that kind of thing. And then debt service is only 6%. It's a, like I said, it's become an art, and it's very difficult, and the budget is a living document, and it's ongoing. And one of the things I'd like to explain, and, and people have, uh, especially because of, I hate to say it, the press misleads a lot of people. When you're dealing with the budget, they're always talking about, well, you're raising taxes, you're raising taxes. Actually, when you go to the rollback rate, all you're doing is getting the exact same revenue that you got the year before. You're not raising taxes. The millage rate may go up or go down, but the actual taxes are not going up when you do the uh, rollback rate. So, and it's defined by the state as uh, tax neutral. So it's kind of a miss. If you see that, you have to to go through that process. And what happens is last year, when we lost that 20,000, we had to make it up. We were at the rollback rate. We got beat up by the press. But at the end of uh, a month after that article came out, we were actually way below the millage, millage rate for the rollback rate. And so it, it's kind of like you have to deal with that trying to put the budget together. Now, the other thing that you see, and a lot of people get upset when you get your first tax bill, it's based on the preliminary millage rate. Now, you always set the preliminary millage rate higher than you have to so that in case something comes up, you don't have to notify every citizen in Neptune Beach by registered mail and spend all that money to be able to change it and have another public hearing. So you usually raise that up a little bit so that you have some wiggle room in case something does happen or there's a revenue drop. Then when you actually close the budget, and the budget has to be closed by October 1, then you deal with um, basically uh, figuring out uh, <clears throat> how you're going to put you know, all those things together to make them work at, at October 1 and what's happened between that, whether you have a revenue drop or whatever. So like I said before, it's gotten to be an art. And it's not as much of a financial thing because you don't have a lot of money to spend anymore. Give you an example. One of the other things, and I forgot to mention this, our employees have not had a raise in six years. So it's been pretty difficult. And the most of them have stayed with us. And we have some really talented people. And we're kind of left with the cream of the crop. So it's kind of hard to keep them when other people want to steal them away from you because of their talent. And we've lost some people through that attrition process. If it hadn't been for grants, uh, we would have been in big trouble. Uh, one of the good things is there have been some law enforcement grants, and that's helped us. And we've been able to, uh, for example, right now, the computers and all the cars for the police to write the reports and all the other information they get in the check with NCIC and the federal government and all that, uh, they're about worn out. And we were able to get a grant to replace that so we don't have to pay for that out of the general fund or have to raise taxes for that. But again, I want to reiterate, three beaches are, in my opinion, and I've been doing this stuff for probably more years than some of you all are old, but uh, it is probably uh, one of the best situations I've seen. The taxes are low, comparatively speaking, from across the state, and they do more with less, and so it's really good. And one other thing I want to say is we get zip help from Jacksonville, although they're required by interlocal agreement to help us. So it's like, you know, nothing. I mean, there's no return. Anyway, uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to open it up for questions and try okay. to answer them. We'll do it at the end of the meeting. Oh, okay. Or af after the press. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, because you want to get out of it, don't you? <laughs> 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 do I just hold it down? Okay. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm stupid. I went last, but you asked me questions. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
a short straw here. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I'm uh, Jim Hanson of Atlantic Beach. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to you guys tonight. The, uh, it says a lot for you people who are willing to come out and listen to a pretty boring subject about budgets, <laughs> but I think it's absolutely critical. Democracy cannot work unless people know what's going on. And basically the press is disappearing on us because of their financial concerns and we don't get a lot of coverage. So uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about our budget. Um, I think we're doing a pretty good job overall. And um, we just, um, um, uh, it, it, it's great to be able to, um, to share some of it with people. Um, budgets are boring things. Uh, so uh, I, I'll try to um, uh, make just a few points tonight that might make some sense for you. Um, that maybe help you understand the process a little bit better uh, and try to keep you out of uh, a lot of the details. One thing I think uh, it may, it may surprise a lot of people, a lot of private people, don't realize how many different state rules we have to deal with uh, as municipal governments. We literally covered up with the things. Um, I'll show you in a minute how many different funds we have to have because of all the different state rules. And the private people trying to go through our budget, it drives them nuts. Uh, you're welcome to, to look it over. By the way, ours will be on the web probably Monday once we get it turned out, uh, but I'll try to, to make it um, uh, a little more uh, understandable. Um, <coughs> basically, the um, uh, budget process, not, uh -oh. not working. All right, can you Jim, who is this? Is that a little dance one? Okay. Yeah, do it. it's not do it by hand, okay. Um, well, if you would go on the next slide, or next uh, uh, thing. Our process uh, for the budget really starts with strategic planning. This is in early spring. Uh, it's just a few months after each commission takes office. Uh, obviously, we have our elections in August. They're sworn in in November. Uh, gives the commissioners a few months to get their feet on the ground. We like to get everybody together and talk about what the priorities are for our community. And that very much leads into the uh, budget uh, process. Uh, but once they've, they've gone through that, they've told us with long-term planning, here are the most important things for us uh, that we want you, the staff, to be working on. That turns into the um, um, next phase of the budget, which is staff presentation, preparation. Uh, basically, we go from the time the strategic plan is done, usually in April, uh, through basically now, uh, putting together a budget, working with the department heads, turning it out, uh, getting it ready to, to basically publish. Um, and then we'll go to uh, like I say, the draft budget published with Atlantic Beach, we'll try to get this delivered to our elected officials this Friday, uh, and we hope to have it on the web by Monday morning so that uh, anybody can look it up. The budget workshops, uh, we normally have um, in August. Uh, you're welcome to sit in them. We have four of them scheduled. During that process, we basically try to explain the uh, policy issues, the big issues to the City Commission, and then get their input on the changes that they want to make to the proposed budget so that we can go to the formal uh, uh, public hearing process, which is the last in uh, September. We're all in the same fiscal year by state law, so our year starts October 1. So we have to have a budget adopted, ready to go by October 1, or we're out of business. So um, that's the way we all work. It's working. Okay. One thing that, uh, again, drives people nuts is the issue of multiple funds. Think of them like checking accounts. You have one checking account for your house. Well, imagine if you got another checking account for your grandmother that's living in, a, in, the, in your garage apartment and you're taking care of her Social Security. Another one for the kids' college. Another one for, for one, you know, there's just a lot of different rules and regulations or reasons to have separate checking accounts. In the city of Atlantic Beach, we have over 20 of these things. The general fund is where we have the normal police, uh, fire expenses, you know, this, the, you know, streets, uh, parks. Uh, water and sewer funds are for our, uh, obviously, for water and sewer um, operations, but they have to be kept separate in the books. We have a sanitation fund, uh, which has to be kept separate, a stormwater fund. Uh, both of our pension funds are, um, you know, we have to account for them separately. Uh, the gas tax fund, this is one of the funds where we get revenues from the state, but they put a lot of rules on it. So you can use it for this, you can't use it for that, so we have to segregate the money. So we have another checking account for that. The bed tax fund, basically uh, we get some of the funds that uh, are, are bed taxes, we get a small portion of them, but they're extremely restrictive into what we can use them for. That's another set of accounts we have to deal with. We usually have a number of capital projects funds that we put together just to run certain large projects that may be funded from various other sources. Um, debt service fund, um, 
basically that deals with um, satisfying the bond holders that we're, we've got money left to pay, uh, pay the bonds when they're due, and various grant funds, and sometimes you may even have 10 or 20 of these, uh, but each agency that gives you a grant expects you to keep track of the expenses separately. So um, one thing that drives a lot of people crazy is you'll see all these different funds in a city budget, so there, it's hard to find a simple bottom line. When you add them all together, they really don't mean that much because you can't move the money except in very limited instances between the funds. So that's an important concept. Just to give you a quick overview on the revenues, uh, unlike what Jim Jarbo did, um, this is all of our funds together. Um, just, and I won't get into a whole lot of this, but uh, basically uh, the largest piece of it are our enterprise funds. Uh, this is water, sewer, sanitation, uh, our building department, and stormwater. Basically funds where we collect special revenues just to provide those services. Uh, this second largest one is the general fund, which most people would assume is the largest. It's not. Uh, that's where you have your police and fire, where your property taxes go in and all that sort of thing. Then we have various um, uh, trust funds for the pension and that sort of thing. So I don't need to get into a lot of detail on that, just to give you a sense of the... So, by the way, uh, in revenues in, um, in the current fiscal year, FY13, that was about $27 million for Langham Beach. Probably a little more than Neptune Beach, probably a lot less than Jacksonville Beach. Uh, these are our expenses. They're pretty much in line with uh, where you just saw the revenues. The biggest piece of it actually is the um, uh, portion for uh, water and sewer. Actually, those are our biggest revenues uh, in water and sewer. Uh, but uh, over here is uh, police and fire and that sort of thing. Pretty boring stuff. Now, one point that just to bring you, I know you can't read this, but the, um, we try to make it more understandable for people. I've been doing this 37 years, a lot of complication. That doesn't do you guys any good in, in terms of understanding this. So what we do is put together a budget message. This is the first few pages in our budget document. Uh, usually it's seven or eight pages long. What I've done with this is summarize all the major issues in our budget. If you want to basically get 95% of what this budget's all about, read those first seven pages. There's a few numbers in them, but basically it's an attempt to try to explain, you know, what's going on, what are the big trends, what are the big issues for the elected officials to be dealing with. So um, if you want to look up our budget and you want to know about it, just read that to begin with, and you've got uh, the biggest piece of it. Next thing I wanted to, to, to share with you that's, that I think is absolutely critical after being years in this business is you have to plan long term, and that very much includes the budget. Uh, there's a lot of ways, at least a thousand of them, to make yourself look good in the short term. And in some communities, uh, none of the beach community communities fortunately, but I've seen a lot of communities where they just want to make themselves look good just for this term of office, just get me reelected or whatever the case may be. It's really called kicking a can down the road, a lot, of, a lot of things you can say about it. There's a thousand ways to make yourself look good. I, I know all those tricks. We don't use them. Uh, we, the, the, the key to long-term success in your community is long-term planning. I wanted to run through just one quick real scenario here about stormwater planning, just so you get an idea that it takes, there, there's a lot that goes into this. Um, and I'll just roll through a, a few slides here just to show you what's going on. We have master plans for all of our major systems. Basically, we bring in consultants, have them look at what's going on, give us their best advice as to what we need to do for maintenance, and in some cases, expansions. This is just the cover of our most recent stormwater update. This was from April 2012. Um, this is one of the main pages in the stormwater plan. What it does, it's a map of Atlantic Beach. It shows in each of these areas um, that there is a stormwater problem. Mostly we're just down in nuisance flooding because we put a tremendous amount of money into stormwater projects over the last uh, 12 years, 13 years. Um, but basically it, it, it looks at all the individual problems and comes out with solutions on what we need to do to fix them. This is just one of them, again, a, a map of a certain area of the city. This one happens to be an area where uh, people over the years have filled in the swales and the drainage system doesn't work. And some of the people get upset that they have flooding in their driveways. Well, part of the solution is rebuild the swale system and put some extra piping in. But this is just an example of the graphic that goes with the planning for that. This, and I know you can't read it either, this is a summary, though, in that same strategic plan of all the capital uh, projects by priority order. So this was uh, salt air drainage, the one you just saw, problem area number three. Gives you an estimated capital cost, $250,000. These are in priority order. 
for us, this is some pretty big money. I mean, not astronomical, but some of them are 600 and some thousand, and some of them as small as 25,000. But they put them in an order that makes sense. Like here are the biggest nuisance problems, here you can serve the most people the quickest, uh, that sort of thing. So basically when we get a master plan that does this, how do we put it into the budget now? That's the critical part. This is something that uh, we, we, we are very proud of doing. In all of our major operating funds, we have 10-year plans. Well, we're really budgeting for the next year. We're projecting and planning for 10 years out. What this does, I know it's kind of hard to see, but this will be online. Um, it shows the last two actual years. Uh, the current year, by the way, this is out of the current year's budget, not next year's. Um, uh, and it basically shows 10 years going into the future. What we do here, just to, to, to show you how this graphic works, is we stack our expenses in this. The bottom red line is basically people expenses. In stormwater, you got to have people to clean out the drains, fix minor problems, that sort of thing. Uh, the blue line here is um, operating costs. We may have to pay somebody to come pump out a, a stopped up storm drain line that's full of sand and that sort of thing. Uh, we have debt service, which is the um, blue line uh, here. And these are all stacked, so basically the top expense for the year is the top of that set of lines. The top line in this fund is capital projects. Now the interesting thing here is, if you went right back to that previous slide out of the stormwater fund, these are the capital projects uh, and the dollars they cost, uh, most of them $100 million, uh, stacked out in future years. Now why do we push them out? Because we don't have the money. Uh, we have to spread these out. We don't have the money to do everything at once. The top line on this, is the, the green dotted line is actually how much revenue we expect to gain each year. Obviously there's a number of years where we're spending more than we're taking in because we save the money up. In other years, basically, we don't have enough for the next big project like this one, so we're going to have to bank some of that money until we have enough to do that project under that particular fund. So by having a loan process like this, looking at our needs long term, then we can get the job done. And we've done in Atlantic Beaches, those of you who have Remember Langham Beach a few years ago, we had a lot of flooding problems. This is the very process we used to, um, to basically get these projects lined up and in the budget process. So this is a critical piece of, of your budgeting. It's very boring to a lot of people, but it's absolutely critical that you take a long-term look at what your needs are going to be, maintain your system. Almost all these projects are maintenance. Um, but doing that long-term, you'll wind up in good financial shape. I think Langham Beach is in good financial shape because of doing this. Last, just to very quickly get over some of the um, uh, big issues uh, for this year. I know the time's probably running out here. Um, revenues are flat while some costs are still rising. As Jim said, uh, the tax digest plummeted on us a few years ago. In our case, it was about $400,000 a year. It dropped, um, and basically we're in a trough. We're not seeing any evidence of new revenues coming up, uh, while on the other hand, we pay Jacksonville to do our fire service. It's got automatic escalator of 3% a year. Uh, Health care costs we expect to go up again this year. There are a number of things that are kind of beyond our control. Uh, we can adjust the health care benefits a little bit, but, but we do have some costs going up. The um, good news is, um, uh, and I don't mean to, to get too much out before it gets to our elected officials. I know our, our <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem is here listening <laughs> intently. There are no revenue increases proposed in this year's budget. We're able to hold the line on um, services for another year. We did have to cut some people like Metro Beach did. Um, but um, basically, we're able to hold steady uh, and get by without any rate increases in for this coming year, although it's getting tougher and tougher to do. Uh, one of the reasons we're able to do that is we just finished a two -year, almost two-year process of pension and benefit reform. It's a very painful process um, for the general employees those that are, will be new and those that were not vested are no longer on the defined benefit plan. We put them on a defined contribution plan. It's kind of like a 401 plan or a, you know, um, an IRA for, for most other people. Um, and we increase the, the contribution employees that are staying on the, the defined benefit plan, the folks that were vested. For police, uh, we have to keep the defined benefit plan if we intend to keep getting state revenues. Um, Basically, they're your revenues, but channeling through the state and the state set the minimum standards. But we came out with a much lower set of benefits for new officers to be hired after this date. So obviously, the savings aren't immediate. We also made some major um, benefit changes. Um, 
Leave accruals was, was slashed, the, the annual sellback of uh, leave that was unused was eliminated, uh, termination sellbacks were cut in half, longevity program was eliminated, uh, several other things were done basically to, to meet the numbers that uh, the city commission set for us to meet. But we got it done, actually had to go through an impasse with one union, went basically right up to the steps of the impasse, basically think it was like a court hearing with a special magistrate to, to hear your, your case. Uh, but it finally got done, and um, uh, nobody was happy about it, but we did save a considerable amount of money. So actually, for next year, it's saving us about $200,000 in costs, and those costs will grow. As you can imagine, with things like eliminating a longevity pay program, we didn't cut anybody's pay, but we said there'll be no more raises in the future. So the savings on that happen as uh, the uh, employees that have been here a while retire, and they're replaced with new folks, and there are no new raises given. So we anticipate these savings will grow uh, over the next uh, 20 years. Um, paying benefits, though, is an issue. Uh, as Jim said, um, with the, uh, in the market starting to pick back up, we're starting to lose some very good employees to private industry. Uh, we have a pay plan study going on right now to look at um, what do we need to do to try to retain some of our best employees. Uh, and it's, uh, it's kind of scary to lose some of these men and women that really know what they're doing and, and be back in the market uh, competing with people who don't have the skills. One good thing about the recession is a lot of contractors were laying people off. The hiring market was really good. It's nice, particularly in the utility business, to get some people who know how to operate a backup, which you can hire right off the street. Um, police building is something you've, you've read a lot about in the paper. Uh, right now, that's uh, deferred, uh, but um, virtually anybody that walks in our police building would agree we need to do something. Uh, we have saved up through long-term planning, um, about $2.6 million. Uh, that's in a capital projects fund waiting for a solution. Uh, it is deferred until after the budget is over. Actually, at my request, we didn't have time to do any more studying on it right now. We had to get the budget turned down. So um, basically, that's a big issue the commission will have to deal with in the future. And last is tipping fees. Uh, you've probably heard we have a bit of a disagreement with the city of Jacksonville about landfill fees. Uh, they think they're owed. Uh, Neptune Beach and Atlantic Beach have concluded that uh, they haven't quite met the requirements in their local agreement. In the meantime, though, Jacksonville thinks we, they're tolling us for this, these fees. And basically for us, it's up to about $800,000. That's a pretty good bit of money for a small city, and we've been trying to get it resolved. We have not been able to get it resolved then for a number of reasons. Uh, but uh, obviously that's a big issue. We need to keep in the back of our minds that we may be liable for that. We're going to have to set some money aside for however this turns out. When we do get it resolved with Jacksonville, there's a pretty good chance we're going to have to have a sanitation fee increase. Uh, just a question of how much. So those are the big issues that we'll be dealing with. Um, let's see. Last um, information will be available on our website. The entire budget, by the way, which is this. If you guys have never seen one of these things, I'll pass it around. Um, it's so long because we have so many funds. Uh, but again, the, um, the simple important part is the first few pages where we've got a, a narrative description and in the very back, if you know how to look at these things, are these 10-year plans. I mean, when, once you stare at them a while and you realize what they're saying, it's a simple graphic way to kind of get your hands around the whole fund and say, aha, I got it. I see where they're going. So with that, I'm probably about finished up with my 15 minutes and I'll look forward to any questions you have. Thanks. Budget is just about money, you're on the wrong road. And the budget is actually a fascinating document. And it's so important because it's not just about money, because it's about what's the purpose and role of government. The budget's one of the most powerful policy documents in the entire city. And start out with this with the city, you know, what's our mission? What are we supposed to do with this money? What are we trying to accomplish? Well, what we're trying to accomplish, and this, I don't think this will be too much different than in, in our three cities, but you now my main goal is building community and quality of life. That's what we're trying to do in Jackson Beach. 
That's through public safety to maintain a community where people feel free from crime and fire to have good emergency management services. That's Jim talked about environmental protection. I want to live in a community that protects my health by providing safe water to drink, reliable garbage collection, and clean waterways through the treatment of stormwater wastewater while preserving the environment for future generations. That's really important, preserving the environment. Uh, sense of community. I want to live in a community that provides parks, open space, and recreational opportunities for all ages and it gives us a sense of community. Sense of place and neighborhood vitality. I want to live in a city with vibrant neighborhoods that are clean, safe, encouraging a sense of place and preserve property values. Responsible government. I want a fiscally responsible government that maximizes the use of public funds and provides great customer service. And reliable electricity, I'm going to live in a city that delivers reliable electric services while encouraging conservation and environmental responsibility with service that is above and beyond the expected. This, in a nutshell, is the missions of the city. Why this is so important also is that whenever we talk about economic development, you know, the, the two keys to economic development, this has been true for 50 years, is two big things. If somebody wants to, to locate in any of the beach communities, the first thing they're going to know is what's the educational system. Before I moved here, what's the status of the schools? What's the educational system like? How many people in this room know somebody that's moved from Duval County, say, to St. John's County, because they thought their kids would have better schools? I mean, I do, I know. So, you know, the, the, the top thing people look at when they're willing to look in a community and build a business is, is education. We can't compete in a global economy without a great education system. Okay, well, that's not my mission directly, that's a school board. But the second thing they look at is the quality of life. If you're going to move someplace, you know, what's the quality of life in that, in that city? Does it have vibrant neighborhoods, a vibrant downtown? What's, what are the citizens like? Does it have a sense of place? Even community design is critical uh, for the environment, for people to have a sense of place. So this is why I say, you know, hey, the budget's not boring at all. It's got all these things in it, and uh, it's tremendously important. It's one of the most important documents in the entire city. But you don't just start with the money. You've got to start with what problem you're trying to solve. What's the mission of the city? Jackson Beach has got a lot of strengths. We're an engaged and well-educated community. The people in this room tonight are evidence of that. We've got over four miles of oceanfront. We've got uh, we've uh, rebuilt our downtown uh, and continuing downtown improvements. Uh, we totally, most of you probably don't realize this, but we totally rebuilt the South Beach, Beach area of the city uh, through our redevelopment uh, processes, and we'll talk about that later. later. We've got clean parks and recreation facilities rebuilt. We virtually rebuilt over the past, really, decade uh, every single park and recreation site we have. Uh, we, it's my lifeblood to keep our facilities well maintained, creating a favorable impression with visitors. Uh, we're fiscally conservative city management with low municipal debt. As a matter of fact, we're, right now we're planning to be out of debt within six or seven years. And we've got dedicated, committed employees. So that's I see as the strengths of our community. Uh, my big areas of concern, Jim discussed, uh, both Jims discussed, uh, revenue limitations due to the economy or legislation. Uh, each year, the state legislature, you know, I kind of wish they would focus on what the state's supposed to do, but they love to look at any way they can take money away from local government. I mean, because obviously it doesn't hurt them. Uh, but the past couple of years, they've been trying to change the uh, business taxes on us. Um, so revenue limitations due to the county or state or rural legislation is always a concern every time they meet. Um, I'm real concerned about the expiration of local option gas tax in 2016. That's going to expire uh, unless it's renewed. That will cost us $700,000, and, and street maintenance, I think it's probably true in all three beach communities, will be gone, because that's the main money that we use to, uh, to do street maintenance. Some of you might have seen some work in Jackson Beach. Uh, right now, we're doing street maintenance on about 18 miles of streets. Uh, so that's a critical area of concern I have. Uh, another, uh, probably, I'm just going to admit it, one of my major <coughs> concerns is the cost of providing services to a large number of users. <coughs> Release lifeguards, beach and streets, clean up traffic and crowd control. So obviously I'm concerned about the downtown. We have all the parking downtown. Jackson Beach is one of the major places to go when people from Jacksonville surrounding area want to go to the beach. Certainly got a lot of advantages, got a lot of headaches because of it also. If you don't believe me, ask Bruce Thomason back there, because I know he knows. Uh, keeping well-trained and highly motivated workforce. Uh, that's, that's very important to us. Jim mentioned that. 
Um, the fact is, we haven't, none of the beach cities have given pay increases for several years, and that's a major concern. Uh, another major concern with labor costs is, is set wages, making sure they're competitive. Uh, pension costs continue to rise. We'll talk about that a little bit. Health insurance continues to rise. Uh, the impact of Obamacare, I think, in the in long term is going to raise costs. And so that's a major, major concern, especially in our general fund. The cost of infrastructure maintenance and replacement. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have, especially in the public works area I'll discuss, is out of sight, out of mind. Uh, the people don't see the sewer system, they don't see the water system, they don't see that much of the stormwater system, therefore it's not a problem. Well, bad news for it is. Um, uh, Jim talked a little bit about the, uh, well, now's a good time. We've got a storm front, hurricanes or major catastrophes are always on our mind. We always have to be geared up for a major hurricane or tropical storm. The three beach communities have been, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really worried about the hurricane or big tropical storms because the three beach communities have done so well compared to the outlying areas of tropical storms that we got no place to go but down, Jim. That's my big fear. Uh, because we've done such a great job getting everything cleaned up much, much faster than other areas have. Um, Interlocal agreements, uh, I, Mr. Job, I think, talked a lot about that. Um, our relationship with Jacksonville is really based on the interlocal agreement because the city of Jacksonville is our county, okay? The city of Jacksonville sometimes they act as the city of Jacksonville, and when it's convenient, they act as Duval County also. The city is our county. So anyway, that, that creates some internal strains here and there, and, uh, and uh, Jim explained them. I'm not going to explain any more of that tonight. I don't want to get myself in trouble. I have no problems, Jim, okay? Uh, reductions in federal programs. Um, you know, the, uh, we've got sequestration. Uh, apparently there's going to be no air show in Jacksonville this year, although it's not scheduled for the beaches, but will there be one next year? I don't know. You know, uh, they're talking about coming back on community health block grant monies, which is very important for us. We use that to support the Carver Center. So what's going to happen with the federal budget? The federal budget will have an impact on all of us, so we'll have to see about that. So these are my main areas of concern. <laughs> And when I talk about out of sight, out of mind, just think about this. We've got 109 miles of water mains. You ever see those, worry about those? No, but they require maintenance all the time. 85 miles of sewer mains. Again, uh, they require maintenance. 858 fire hydrants have to be flushed and maintained every year. 10,410 water services underground, out of sight, out of mind. 2,652 water valves, out of sight, out of mind. If you don't get those exercised or replaced when you need them, uh, they will be useless. Uh, City of Jacksonville Beach in the last five years has fallen behind on our water valve maintenance and replacement, although we're catching up now. We have 38 sewage pump stations. Does anybody know what a sewage pump station is? <laughs> Some of you do? If they don't work, I guarantee you, you'll find out. <laughs> but what they do is, you know, the water has to get to the, the sewage has to get to the waste treatment plant. And if it can't get there by gravity flow, you've got to pump it uphill until the gravity flow can take it to the waste treatment plant. Well, that's 38 sewage pump stations, each with two pumps in them, that have to be working seven days a week, 24 hours a day, every day of the year. As a matter of fact, everything on this list has got to be working in good shape seven days a week, every day of the year, 24 hours a day. Most of you don't think about it, but the city never sleeps. I mean that very sincerely. We have to be ready to provide the services for you every day of the year, no exceptions. So th this is one of my frustrations, is out of sight, out of mind. I think we're doing pretty good, uh, but you can always do better. The general fund I'm going to talk about now a bit. The general fund is the city's primary operating fund. Primary revenue source is uh, property tax, which is 40%. Our primary expense is police and fire, which is 63%. Your property tax is paid for police, fire, first responder services, street maintenance, parks and recreation, planning, building, inspection, and code enforcement. And in the last check I had, um, the median home in Jacksonville Beach, when I say median, you'll remember with, remember in school, mean, median, and low, median means half the, half the values are above it and half the values are above, below it. But according to the, the uh, property appraiser's office, the median value of a home in Jacksonville Beach is $186,680. And if we did a calculation of what we expect next year's tax roll to be, that person, the average person, would be paying $2,813 in taxes. 
And of that 2000, I know a lot of people think, and I'm going to explain this in the next chart, a lot of you think that your property tax bill all goes to the city of Jacks Beach or Neptune Beach or Atlantic Beach. It doesn't. We get about 20% of that. So out of that $2,813 of someone's going to have persons going to be in taxes, the city of Jackson Beach gets $572. So, so that person pays, that average person then pays $48 a month for all these services. And personally, I think $48 a month, the average for all those services, is, is a pretty good deal. Uh, again, where the money comes from, taxes, 40%. Communications taxes, those used to be franchise fees for telecommunications. Those are now collected by the state and, and uh, uh, given back to the city based on the point, point of where they were. Although they're trying to take that away from us too. That's another thing the state's looking at. Uh, from other governments, that's sales taxes that are collected statewide and transferred back. Transfers, that's a rate of return from Beaches Energy and it's also the local option gas tax we discussed before. So. This makes up sort of the major, major uh, revenue funds for the general fund. The general fund property tax, as you can see, it's uh, about a million dollars less than it was in 2010. Uh, overall budget's gone down. General fund budget's gone down by over a million dollars in the last three or four years. Uh, so our, our uh, property tax revenues have declined. Our total budget's declined by about a million or so. and. Um, We've had tremendous increases in health costs and pension costs, and yet we're still in great financial shape and, uh, and I think doing a good job. Where your property taxes go, well, this is what I was saying before. Uh, you know, this could be plus or minus by the time we're done. But basically, the city of Jackson Beach gets 20% of your property tax dollars. City of Jackson Beach, 33%. School board, 45%. The that really makes up. 98% of uh, what you're paying for. So you're paying for Jacksonville, Jacks Beach, and school through your property taxes. General fund spending, I'm glad Bruce Thompson's in the audience because despite what he's going to tell you, you can see that going back through 2007, I'm glad you're here, Bruce. This is going to work out real well. <laughs> <laughs> through 2007, uh, Bruce, by the way, you can feel sorry for us. He worked for me for about 18 years. <laughs> so you can tell here that all the other departments, their budgets have gone down by. Uh, over a million. The only budgets that have gone up since 2007 are police and fire. And I, and I, I'm not I'm joking. Bruce. I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just talking about the facts of life. Um, where the money goes, again, uh, we're talking about general fund and uh, fire department is 19 percent, police department 44 uh, percent, streets 8 percent, parks 12 percent, planning development about 6 percent, non-departmental executive. Uh, most of the money in there are things like uh, insurance, citywide insurance, property insurance, like value insurance, things like that. Um, when I talk about concerns that I had in my opening chart, uh, life, health, and dental funds, you can see since uh, where we were, as far as what we paid in 2002, about $1.2 million for health insurance and what we're paying right now around $2.274 million. We project also that uh, health insurance uh, may go up uh, dramatically for us even next year. So we're actually right now we're in the, we're, in the, we're putting out proposals right now for health insurance and we had a big meeting on that this week. And like the other big cities, our health insurance costs of uh, and our health insurance plans for employees to keep the costs as flat as we can have gone up dramatically. I mean, just a few years ago was the good old days where you know you went you went to a doctor and you could get a copay of whatever it was, $20, $30, and that was the end of it. They were procedures, you know, were very inexpensive. But now, for at least in our city, um, uh, a single person would have to pay the first $4,000 before any insurance would kick in, and a, a family person with more than one person on their insurance would have to pay $8,000 before any insurance kicks in. So it's come to be much more of a, you know, it's come to be much more of a, um, a um, emergency plan than what we've been used to. And I'm not saying right or wrong, but I'm saying it's the only way that we can afford it, and uh, and uh, you know that's the way it is. Well, I don't see any time soon things going back. So health insurance costs are a big concern of mine. Uh, the uh, our pension cost kind of blows you away. 2004, we only had to pay. This, this is this is the city's cost, by the way, not the employee cost. The employees pay also, but the city only had to pay about 176,000. In 2004, back in the good old days when our pension plans were almost totally funded, almost 100% funded, now you can see it takes your breath away. We're going up to 2.955 million. Uh, we're working real hard right now on uh, on changing our pension plans because we too can no longer afford these kind of increases. 
redevelopment. Uh, we have two redevelopment districts in the city, the downtown and the south end. And you know, frankly, I, again, I think uh, most people look at the downtown, but um, I really like to talk about the south end first. Um, the south end, um, get to the next slide. South end of Jacksonville Beach. Uh, uh, this, these, these yellow lines show you our south end redevelopment district. Um, the uh, dividing lines on it. Are, you know, this is this is uh, the big. This is the public shopping center in here. Uh, this is the Home Depot shopping center. Uh, this is this is uh, I believe this is Osceola in here. And so you can see that virtually every almost everything uh, west of A1A and south of Osceola is in a redevelopment area. And uh, it's really one of the most successful redevelopments anywhere in the state of Florida. We built these two shopping centers for redevelopment. We built a third shopping center with uh, Joseph Van Bank is in that one through redevelopment. Ocean K is a city development. Paradise Key with the HGE home is a city development. Our newest one actually is Avalon, which is outside the redevelopment district, which is located right in this area right here where I'm pointing to now. There's about 62 homes that are going to be built in there. That was through our redevelopment efforts. Um, We've uh, got the um, Riptide was, beach, well, was built through our redevelopment efforts. South Beach Parkway was built through our redevelopment efforts. Osceola was built through our redevelopment efforts. Jacksonville Drive was built through our redevelopment efforts. South Beach Park was built through our redevelopment efforts. Uh, Cradle Creek, Avalon, and uh, a lot of other things. So I just want to say that, again, this whole area within the yellow lines was almost all rebuilt due to our redevelopment. It's one of the most successful redevelopments of an area anywhere in the state of Florida. Uh, and this gives you a look at where things were before 1980s and after 2008. If you uh, you take a look at the downtown, I think most of you know what we've done there. Uh, when I first came to the city, our downtown consisted of, I think Einstein's was there. Does anybody remember Einstein's? <laughs> Believe me, Einstein had nothing to do with that place. Uh, we had the crab pot. Does anybody remember the crab pot? Yeah. Yeah. Bruce and I remember the crab pot real well. We had some major problems there. But uh, I, one of the happiest days of my life was when I tore down that thumb. <laughs> and we had buckets. That was about it. And our downtown looked like a bombed out World War II city that nobody ever bothered to repair. The uh, seawalk from 3rd to 6th was broken concrete everywhere. Uh, the sidewalks were all broken up and cracked. And nobody believed in repairing them. Uh, our downtown was really, really had, really <coughs> was in total disrepair, and part of that was the city's own fault because we had said that we were going to buy up the whole downtown, 63 blocks, and give it to a developer, and he was going to rebuild the entire downtown. Yeah. None of those three plans worked out very yeah, yeah, yeah. well, so we took it over, did it ourselves. You can see Lakeland Plaza, the beautiful Lakeland Plaza, our city hall. You can see Carabas, Walgreens, uh, <coughs> sneakers, um, rebuilding the lifeguard station. Uh, uh, the Quality Inn Suites, which is soon to be a Sheridan, Best Western. When I got here, the uh, Marriott was just a vacant uh, building. Um, so you can see that we've, uh, our downtown redevelopment area has been tremendously successful. Because, as a matter of fact, I'm tremendously proud of where our downtown looks today. The only, one of the major problems with our downtown today, after we've re had it rebuilt and done a lot of public private partnerships, is we're kind of the victims of our own success uh, right now, that we almost have too many people wanting to come down there at times. Um, if you go to our utilities, um, Jackson Beach is uh, a little bit different in that we provide electric services. Beaches Energy, I think, is, if not one of the most premier uh, electric companies in the state of Florida. We have, I, I don't know if anybody's got better reliability than us, but if we don't have the best reliability in the state of Florida, we're awful close to it. We just put in a natural gas system a few years ago for our commercial customers. Um, these, these, are, these are some of our enterprise funds. And the difference between the general fund and enterprise fund is an enterprise fund is designed to be fee-based and pay its own way. Jim talked a lot about, we already talked about water and sewer. Stormwater, Jim did a good job on explaining. You know, a lot of people think that, you know, I get this all the time, a lot of people think that the city were just a bunch of big regulators and, and sometimes we get in the way. And, you know, sometimes we really probably do. But I can tell you this. In most respects, I'm a lot more heavily regulated than most of the businesses on Jacksonville Beach because all of these things, uh, electric, uh, new federal regulations are driving us a little crazy. Uh, uh, water and sewer, we have tremendous regulations. We're all federal regulations on water and sewer, federal mm -hmm. regulations on stormwater, they're getting harder all the time. There's regulations on garbage. So all these, most of these, not the golf course, of course, <coughs> things that they're, they're tremendously regulated. 
We also have industrial park properties throughout the city and uh, uh, other sites that are part of our lease facilities. And uh, so that's another major source for the city. So that just gives you a rundown of some of the other funds, but the general fund. So tonight I just kind of wanted to give you a these are some of the other areas of concern for federal regulations. But tonight I just wanted to give you just a, you know, kind of a basic rundown. I wanted to give you a different thought process. And again, the budget really, to me, is fascinating. And that wouldn't surprise Bruce at all. And the budget, to me, is, you know, it's not just about money. Yeah, money's part of it. But the budget's about what do we want our cities to become? What goods and services to deliver? How we can improve your quality of life or building community? That's my job. Quality of life, building community, that's my job. That's critically important in economic development. When you look at the beaches communities as a whole, I can tell you this. I lived in Germany for two years. I lived in all different parts of the United States. And I will tell you, uh, the beaches area here is, you know, my wife and I would both agree my family, you know, this is the best area we've ever lived in. So we love it. It's got, uh, we've got great communities, and I think we're very lucky. When I was on vacation this year, uh, driving in other parts of the south, I went by and I looked at, you know, as a city manager, it drives my family crazy. You know, I always want to, I want to go to their city hall. <laughs> if you've got like an eight-year-old daughter, this is not cool. Okay? <laughs> anyway, it drives my family crazy. But i got to tell you, when I do look at these things, I look at their roads, their sense of community, i got to tell you what, the beaches, communities, quality of life, our road systems, our landscaping, and how we look and how we view ourselves to the world, we look pretty darn good compared to most communities. I'm not saying there isn't some better. But uh, most of what I see, we're right up there in some of the top communities. So, but again, the budget's not just about money. It's about what, are you, what services do you want, what quality of life do you want, what problems are we trying to solve. That's really what it's all about. Anyway, I think it's great that with three of us talk because I gave you three different, slightly different perspectives. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to the two gyms to answer any questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you two stand up there. I didn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So do we have questions? Yeah. yeah. Clearly, your budget doesn't work like mine does. Um, you've got money in lots of different pockets, and you can't transfer them from one to the other. If you don't spend all the money in one pocket one year, what happens to that money? Well, it accumulates in that fund, as you saw in our stormwater fund, Often we try to save it up for future capital projects. If we get to a point where we feel like we get too much, we can lower rates. That's usually not the case. Hopefully we're, we'll, we'll just smooth it out and not raise rates for a number of years. But unspent funds can't be transferred to another fund. There are some abilities to move the funds back and forth, but they are very limited. And it's just a, a, a very long and arcane list of state rules. Like bed tax funds, basically you can use for, use them for. Uh, if you have a convention center, you can you can build it, you can maintain it. We don't have one of those here at the beach, so uh, basically uh, for cities over a certain size, uh, we can build new recreation facilities. I can't maintain them, but you can build new ones. So it's uh, you know gas tax has to only be used for streets uh, and stormwater systems, uh, but you can use it for maintenance, but you can't use it for other things. Um, you know, your water and sewer funds uh, basically are supposed to be there to maintain the water and sewer system. You transfer some of the general fund. We do. Uh, but there's a limit to that. Uh, so th th you can move them a little bit, but it's, a, it, it's, it's almost a science trying to figure out what you can do. You, we, George made a point where we we're very, very hamstrung by all the state regulations, and it seems like there are more of those every, every year. And actually, there was one, uh, one year I sent out a list to the newspaper. They'd never seen it at... A state office had compiled all the new state regulations that affect the local governments, called mandates. These are things that cost us more money. It was on an Excel spreadsheet. There were like 20 items per page, and it was like 30 pages. I sent it to the, to the Times Union, and they just blew their mind that there were that many new regs. A lot of them affected schools, a lot of them affected counties, a lot of them affected cities. But it's just amazing all the, all the regulation we have to deal with. I have one simple question. I work for a major company, very large company, and one of the benefits was the fact that there were so many of us, we got a very good deal on health insurance. And the one thing that I still haven't understood is why, since you know we're talking about smaller communities, why you can't group together and, and make one large big pool for health insurance, that is, 
you know, the more people you have, as a rule of thumb, the, the lower the rates go. So there's no reason why cities, you know, about our size, why you all couldn't come together and, and, and pool and have one health insurance policy to cover all of you? We've looked at it off and on over the years. We've looked at going with Jacksonville's plan, and it, it, it's a good idea, but it's not as simple or workable. It also depends a lot on the age of your workforce, too, you know, as far as how it's going to be and what your losses are to date on your plans. Right now, many of the plans like ours is, um, it, you know, it's, it's so cost-based that they, they, you know, we work with the, we have a thing with the insurance company where, you know, they track the costs and um, we know exactly at the end of the year whether, whether we're plus or minus for what we pay in and, and uh, they get to, you know, we or they get to make up the difference. So I don't know, it's a good theory, but I guess when we looked at it together in practice, you know, over the years here and there, it hasn't been as feasible as we had hoped. But that's my only yeah, concern. One thing, yeah, when you're a it. small city, uh, instead of being rated as a big company, you're rated on a community scale. And that helps, but also you're rated on uh, how much uh, they have to pay out every year. And I know that if we went with Jack Speech, it might save us some money, but it wouldn't save them any money. It would probably cost them more money. Well, they don't that's that's because of the money that they have to pay out. If, if our experience is worse, which it has been for the last five years, then the insurance company has, for example, right now, our cost uh, is basically about uh, 600000 but they're paying out about uh, 900000 in claims. But don't you have a league of cities, and if all the league of cities came together... We could, the league of cities does do that, and we tried to get them to quote us, and they wouldn't quote us. Because we've got such bad experience. Well, that's <laughs> what most other insurance, other than the health, mm -hmm. um, health insurance, we are uh, we're covered by Florida Blue, which was Blue Cross Blue Shield, now. and they have sort of a pool of small employers. We're not big enough to by ourselves to get in there. But, now the League of Cities, though, for most other insurances, uh, yeah. does have an insurance pool, uh, mm -hmm. and we take liability of and some. There's really only a couple of markets in Florida for municipal insurance. It's such a specialized business. So there really isn't an insurer who would be willing to let you all come together as one, in other words. We've talked about trying to bid them all together um, a couple of times, and we just, for various reasons, never never got that completed. I think for, for most of us, what that means is through experience, because we're small, our costs can go up and down relatively large, uh, a large amount from one year to the next. We have a, a few major cases, our experience rating looks bad, like, like Jim's is right now. You can bet the next year's costs are going to go up. If we go a couple of years without a lot of uh, bad, yeah. bad hits, our, our costs are going to go down. And that, that variation is what you're really trying to save more than anything else. Right, but the more the, more the people, then, then the line evens right. out, and then, right. then that's when your rates go down. Or at least level out. Obviously, it's hard okay, to budget we'll when you've got a okay, you know, we'll $200,000 shift in cost one year to the next. And we've had that a couple of times. In your opinion, should the city of Jacksonville and the county be supporting the beaches? And if the answer is yes, why aren't they? And then what can we do to make that happen? It's been a continuing problem. I worked for the city of Jacksonville, two mayor staffs for 15 years. And the only time the beaches were able to ever get anything is to go to court and make Jacksonville act as a county. And they don't supply all the county services, but they take the revenue from the beaches, which is a tremendous amount of money that helps their budget. And, you know, we're the first to get cut. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a library issue right now, uh, which makes absolutely no sense. It's the third largest used library in the county right now. Yet they want to close it down, and it's the only one on the east end of the county. It makes no sense at all, but that's what's happening. And we go through that all the time with them. So are they just allowed to do as they choose? Is that what I'm understanding? Unless we go to court and get a court order to, to stop it. So Atlantic Beach did that about, uh, I think it was 98, uh, and finally got another settlement. And it cost Atlantic Beach about $400,000 of legal fees to be able to get that. So do I understand that the city of Jackson, uh, city of Jacksonville and the county don't listen to our uh, needs and respond to them 
Well, and to give you an example, and say if we yeah. want to do anything, yeah. go to court. Is that, that that's exactly it. That's, that's, that's a sad that. situation. The latest administration, yeah, we used to meet on a regular basis with the mayor of Jacksonville and try to discuss our problems, and we had a di dialogue. Uh, it's been close to three years with our last meeting with this present administration's mayor with our mayors. And, you know, we've tried to set up meetings, but we haven't been very successful at it. And if somebody doesn't want to communicate with you, then you have to use a sledgehammer to get them to come to the table. One thing that, that may be helpful to realize, Jacksonville has had a lot of turnover, mayors and top staff. Um, and a lot of the top staff they have brought in, quite frankly, don't have any municipal experience. There's some bright people. But, you know, if you put a brain surgeon in charge of a sanitation truck, he's going to crash the truck. You know, because he doesn't know how to drive the truck. Well, that's an advantage of the council manager form of government we have here in the three beach cities that, assuming we do our jobs well, uh, generally we keep them from one administration to the next. You'd be hard put to find three adjacent cities in Florida with as much experience as the three of us. Uh, and I think that does make a difference. For Jacksonville, they get new mayors, new staff, they don't even understand the interlocal agreement, have never read it. They've got lots of other problems to deal with, frankly. They have been kicking the can down the road in a lot of ways from a budget standpoint. They've got themselves in a terrible economic mess. Uh, they're trying to solve that. And we're just a small piece of their much bigger problem. So we don't get a lot of attention. You know, Jim's got a better perspective on us on it than the rest of us because he's worked for both. The only time that you get any particular uh, attention to problems we have or details is if enough noise is made during the election year in Jacksonville because the beaches vote. And that's the key for helping our cities get what they need from Jacksonville is getting that commitment in the election process. Now, as managers, we can't be involved in that because we're not political. But that's that's the truth. And that's where it goes. Can I mention one thing that I forgot to say that I think is important? And I get this question all the time. What are you doing with all those sales taxes from the restaurants and stuff in town center and out there? And most people think all those sales taxes go to the beach of cities. The only amount that we get in sales tax, if, for example, a big warehouse was, instead of being built here, was built in Baldwin, we get the same amount of sales tax. We only get the percentage of our population versus the county percentage. Times so, half. And half. And for the special purpose sales tax. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's... It's minuscule compared to what goes to the county. Thank you. For, for any of the three of you, uh, going back to what you're talking about with the separate funds, do you have any flexibility in the event of, um, say, a, a massive destruction from a storm, something like that, where you've got millions of dollars of infrastructure damage? Do you have some flexibility to move money within any funds at all, more yeah, so than you do now? Normally what you do is you have reserve funds to take care of those, those type of problems. And what those reserve funds do is allow you to get until the federal government declares a disaster and starts putting the money in so that you do have enough operating funds. Most cities carry in their general fund, and as a rule of thumb, uh, and their other funds, 25%. Or three months operating reserve and so that that's key and then the other is that a lot of the institutions will give you a line of credit to operate until FEMA starts repaying you now of course with dealing with FEMA you know sometimes that's years I mean we had a storm in 2004 and everything was closed out and now they're asking money back from us so, you know, it's, <laughs> Bruce knows you're on your own after a, an emergency for a while because there's yeah. no, no state or federal help you, you do it yourself yeah. Hey, Jim, Jim, thank you for your, your evening time. Um, this is going to be twofold. George, what was the revenue uh, for Jacksonville Beach last year? I don't think we. <coughs> your, would you operate with revenue? The general fund revenue last year uh, was around eighteen million dollars. Eighteen something. The, um, the other thing I was came with your discussion earlier, Jim. The um, and I'm not in, or confident about millage stuff, but uh, when you're comparing millage rate and you're showing us that board and it has our beach communities and right. you know where we're at versus like a <coughs> let's consider another destination area like a Fernandina or St. Augustine, which is vastly different, much higher. 
then there's even an orange park out there. When does it become, or does it become an issue that we're hurting ourselves because we're operating so lean and, I guess, efficiently that we're missing, like if you're saying people are leaving the, or leaving the beaches area to go work somewhere else, or, you know, when do you adjust some of that thinking? Because we all want quality of life and we love where we live, we understand enough of it, but do you, who, what does it take? That, that's well, what the current budget process that we're going through now, and that's where the elected officials come in. Uh, their job is more difficult than any of our jobs, really, because they've got to balance not just apples and apples, but they've got to balance a new fire truck for the, for the fire chief versus a tax increase versus fixing a water line. I mean, these are, these are very hard things to do, and that's why we, why we have a democracy. Um, and it's, it's up to us as city managers to give the, the elected officials our best judgment. Are your utility systems being maintained adequately, or is this a ticking time bomb that's going to fall apart in just a few years if you don't put some money in them now? Basically, uh, those kinds of questions are the things we grapple with trying to share the best information we can with the elected officials so they can make those absolutely critical decisions about when do we have to have a tax rate increase and that sort of thing. Right now in our city, I think we're in pretty darn good shape um, with the utility systems and all of that. There's always going to be some tight times. and We, you know, we, we can't ever have all that we want. But um, if, uh, if I felt like they were not doing the right thing, they'd, they'd hear from me. And unfortunately, we've had a very, I think all the elected officials at the beaches have been very <coughs> responsive in terms of long-term view and not just making themselves look good just for this term of office or, or kicking a can down the road like, like a lot of other cities have done. So. Well, I was just hearing you know, as a just to that, losing people, though. One of, one of the things on the utility side, which is a different funding process, and it's basically uh, self-supporting, and it goes from the fees that are charged for the water and sewer utility. Uh, a few years ago, we had a tremendous drop in revenue because of... Uh, People were conserving and the housing market was going down and you had vacant houses and it was critical to us and actually the city council at that time stepped up to the, the plate and realized they had to do it and they're the ones that actually set the policy not management and with the advice of management they set the rates and did a 15-year uh, plan to deal with it in our city and we did that and that's why we will start doing a rehab in certain areas of the city of water and sewer that needs to be done uh, probably uh, late this year. Thanks. Good question. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The impact of the, uh, I know Neptune Beach took care of the nitrogen impact with the stormwater sewer system and stuff. Atlantic Beach and Jack Beach done that? We have completed ours. Uh, we consolidated our two wastewater plants, which saved us a lot of money uh, efficiency-wise, but ours has been completed. Uh, and uh, we are meeting the TMDL nitrogen standards at this point, and um, it cost us uh, uh, about uh, ten million dollars of bond revenues that we had to had to get into debt over. Uh, but um, we'll pay that off, off over twenty years, and um, I think we you know we're able to um, operate pretty efficiently. The rates are uh, our rates right now are uh, tied with or below GAs rates. I'd just like to point out, all three of us meet the requirements as they are today, but they're already working on new requirements for tomorrow. So <laughs> I'm probably to help us tomorrow. So the you have to spend more money to get there. I'm just well, my first job <laughs> was to help in an upgrade of a major sewer plant. Literally, there's been no time since 1976 that we've not either been building a new wastewater upgrade or plant, or planning to build one. So there are always new regulations coming down the pipe. It's been for the better. In 1976, when I started in this business, wastewater treatment was pretty minimal, and what was going into our streams was terrible. Um, but it, you know, you, it, it's getting more and more stringent, and you're paying more and more for it. So um, it, it really is a never-ending process. But I do want to say we all want to we all want to help clean up the environment. We all want the river and our uh, you know rivers and our waterways to be clean. The problem has to be what what's the cost-effective level? In other words, if you can remove. 90, 95% of the, the uh, uh, problems for a million dollars, but to get to 99% cost 10 million. Where do you draw the line? And I think those are things we're always talking about. Next up is going to be phosphorus. They're going to add phosphorus requirements to us next, and then they'll be somebody to think of something after that. So again, I'm all for spending the money to really help improve the environment. I'm, I'm not for spending the money if it's if it's negligible results. You know, we were talking about pension. 
and one of the things I'd like to give credit to a previous city manager about 20 years ago in uh, Neptune Beach, James Barrington, he had a lot of foresight in dealing with the pension problem. And we're lucky that we don't have that problem because he did what a lot of cities are doing now and he was able to get all of our employees except, as Jim mentioned, the police department because of the state monies. All our employees were on a 401A is what government's called. And uh, so we don't have a tremendous pension problem like you're reading in the paper and unfunded liability because we don't have that uh, defined benefit pension. It occurs to me that the farthest, the farther you get away from home, the more the politicians lose their minds. I don't understand how, they, how the federal government or the state government can jam on the beaches about total dissolved solids and then permit a paper company to dump dioxin and chlorine into the river upstream. Imagine having most most of the students run probably in kids, right? It's easy for your for your son or your daughter to spend your bucks when they're in college or high school, right? Well, the same thing holds true with the state and federal government. Uh, the elected officials they can make people happy by saying, "Yeah, I'll solve that problem. I'll, I'll make them pay for it." You know, so it's it's easy to spend somebody else's money, and in some cases, way too easy. I think it's important to have the, the government that makes the decisions to spend the money ought to be the same ones responsible for raising the money. You can see some different decisions being made sometimes, but government, local governments, uh, uh, basically are closest to the people and uh, most accountable for, that, for those reasons. Yes, ma'am. Um, I know that Mr. Forbes alluded to the quality of life several times in his talk. And Jim, you mentioned the libraries. Well, we, we have the librarian from our Beaches Library here and the regional manager who, who think enough of our city to be here. So what can we do? I know Neptune Beach has sent a strong resolution to the city of Jacksonville, and I believe Atlantic Beach sent a letter. I don't know what Jacksonville Beach has done. Whether the, they, the three beach mayors, as my understanding, all sent the letter and the Jacksonville Beach has a resolution in support of the library on their next agenda. On their next agenda. Yes, okay, good. Because I think that this is something we should go to battle about. I think we, we would probably do that if push came to shove. In our view, Jim and I have, Jim more than I, knows what our new local agreement states. Unless they close all the libraries in the county, they can't close this one. We have we have to get equal services for those taxes we put. That's in. that's required so by the out of court settlement. The, what's called the interlocal agreement. Yeah. So I think I don't. I, well, I'm pretty sure that somebody told me they knew of like a library board member that was in that meeting when they chose which ones they thought they were going to close. They were totally unaware that of the beaches in the local agreements. Uh -huh. So as far as I'm concerned, they can't do that. And would we take them to court? We might have to, but. Ocean <coughs> County. Oh, uh, when Blink said, you could maybe give Sandy to put on her page, going to the interlocal agreements, in case you want to. It is so on the Beaches Watch. It is. Okay. Beaches Watch has um, all three interlocal agreements on our website. It's on the homepage, and you just have to scroll down. There's a link that says something about interlocal agreements, and you click on that link, and you can you can actually read actually, there's all four, three. Actually, there's four interlocal agreements. <laughs> There's the first, right. the first there's one. There's the 1982 one, or whatever, and Which, then there's the three. And then the others are kind of a spin off of that, but the 82 is still in force. Yeah, and so we have all three of those there on the Beaches Watch website. Actually, when the Jacksonville uh, mayor candidates and city council candidates came out to the beach for the Beaches Watch candidate forum and answered questions that Beaches Watch sent them in writing. One of the questions was about the interlocal agreement, and so we were kind of um, we were doing that to hopefully force them to read it. I don't know how many of them did it. Well, just <laughs> recently, this this past week, with our animal control problem with the cats and trying to get Jacksonville, who's responsible for animal control and never does anything, we couldn't get them to come out and help us. Yeah. So, you know, that's typical. We know where to take the cat. Okay, we'll see. <laughs> 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 we'll get a second over here. How do you collect it? <laughs> 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 <laughs>
to have a paper trail, right? If every time that, 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 that they don't do what they're supposed to do, if we send them a bill, we, we, have, we, have, we have a paper trail, believe me. It, it's, it, it happens every time you get a new administration, but this one hadn't called on at all yet. We'll take it off the hundred thousand dollars that's in the bill down for tipping fees. If they go down with minus, you didn't take care of this, you didn't do this, you didn't do that, and that whole field is end up with only a dog, right? Well, that would be a good solution. <laughs> okay, so do we have any other questions? Because it's almost eight thirty, which so it's a long meeting for tonight, but a really, really good meeting. So I wanna. I want to thank the three city managers. Yes. For time. These guys obviously put some time into it, and I know you're preparing to present this to your city councils and your city commissions too. So we really appreciate you giving us a sneak preview of it ahead of ahead of what you're going to be doing soon. And before we uh, conclude the meeting tonight, I don't want to go without recognizing the elected officials that we have here tonight. Um, so we have uh, Maria Mark, who's the Atlantic Beach Mayor Pro Tem, who's here. We also have Janelle Wilson from Jacksonville Beach and Chris Hoffman from Jacksonville Beach. Oh, yeah, and Kara, sorry, I was up here. It's okay. <laughs> Kara Tucker with Neptune Beach. And then also we have Keith Doherty from Jacksonville Beach. Am I missing anybody else? So we want to thank you guys for being here tonight. And I uh, want to remind you the next meeting is uh, Beaches Watch meeting is Wednesday, August 7th at 7 o'clock in the community room of the Beaches Branch Library. We'll have uh, new Chief Jacks Beach Police Chief um, Dooley talking about July 4th and how well it went and as well as the other issues that the Jack's Beach Police are dealing with. And we hope you guys are planning to come out. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.